Okay, anatomy students, so we are in chapter 14, which is our lymphatic and immune system. Um, you know, medically speaking, the lymphatic system is the proper way to name this body system, but we also include immunity in it um, in terms of uh, all the immune system functions, but technically it is the lymphatic system is the proper way to say it. So your lymphatic system is what I call kind of the catch-all system in the body. It's not as well known as your other body systems, but we still cover it. It helps with fluid balance, fat absorption, and defense. So if you think of excess fluid that's outside of your cells that isn't blood, but it's just other types of fluid, that gets picked up by your lymphatic system um, and then kind of taken care of. So when we think about the lymphatic system, it's kind of like a big drainage system of your body for all of this excess fluid. And everything in green that you can see in this picture are all of the ducts, the drainages, the lymph nodes, which would create some of the cells and do some of the cleaning of that fluid. Um, so you can add some organs. So for example, we include the spleen in your lymphatic system the thymus gland, the tonsils, so parts of the body that do kind of extra cleaning or um, kind of recycling of old materials, red, whether it's a red blood cell, whether it's a bacteria, um, but you can see how this lymphatic drainage system travels throughout the body um, in the mammary plexus of the mammary glands. You have lymph nodes and kind of ducts throughout the body going all the way down through the abdominal cavity into your legs. But eventually the lymphatic system will drain all this excess fluid back into the circulatory system. So once it's been kind of cleaned out, it enters back into your subclavian veins, which will enter back into your heart circulatory system. We have the area associated with the right lymphatic duct drainage seen there and then kind of just the right upper half of the body. And then the area associated with the thoracic duct drainage is pretty much the other kind of half and everything below your umbilical region. Components of the lymphatic system is lymph, which is the fluid that enters lymphatic capillaries. It's usually composed of water and other solutes. We have lymphocytes, which is a type of white blood cell lymphatic vessels, lymph nodes, tonsils, spleen, and the thymus gland. So these are our components and they'll kind of take us through the majority of this PowerPoint and lecture as we talk what each component does. So your lymphatic capillaries are um, the tubes or the system of ducts that carries fluid in one direction from tissues back to your circulatory system. So fluid will always move from blood capillaries into tissue spaces. And these lymphatic capillaries are tiny closed ended vessels that fluid moves very easily into in most of your tissues. And they will join to form lymphatic vessels. And again, these lymphatic vessels will eventually take all this fluid picked up back to the circulatory system. The lymphatic vessels um, are a little bit larger than the capillaries. They resemble small veins. These will be where lymphatic capillaries join together. They do have valves in them to ensure the direction of lymph travels only in one direction. Um, the right lymphatic duct is where lymphatic vessels from the right upper limb and right head and neck um, empty, um, that all those regions, upper limb, right head, neck and chest empty and it will empty into the right subclavian vein, which eventually just brings it to your superior vena cava um, back into the right atrium. The thoracic duct is the rest of the body and how that empties. So the rest of the body empties from various lymphatic vessels into your thoracic duct, which will empty into the left subclavian vein to enter the right atrium. So this is just showing kind of the two main ducts, the right lymphatic duct kind of where all the right side of the body enters into. And then the thoracic duct is just the main vessel where everything on the rest of the body empties into. But again, just remember that wherever these lymphatic vessels are draining fluid into, they're all draining it eventually into the subclavian veins, which join to form the superior vena cava. So 
the goal is to get all of this lymphatic fluid eventually back to the heart. So here we have kind of the lymph formation and movement showing how fluid enters lymphatic capillaries and then, um, you know, enters into a lymphatic vessel eventually to the venous system or the heart. Here we have the direction of flow in the cap in the uh, lymph capillary showing a valve and how it will be a one way openings to kind of make sure that fluid flows in one direction as well. Then we have lymphatic organs. So we have this huge kind of drainage system, and then we have different lymphatic organs. The palatine tonsils are on each side of your oral cavity. Pharyngeal tonsils are near the internal opening of your nasal cavity, also called your adenoids. And then your lingual tonsils are on the posterior surface of your tongue. And many times if these tonsils are prone to get infected, filled with bacteria, um, you might get your tonsils removed to just get rid of them because they are places where bacteria can form. And if they're not doing the job properly, many people might just get their tonsils removed. Um, they all kind of form a protective ring of lymphatic tissue around your nasal and oral cavity. So tonsils serve a purpose to kind of form a protective ring um, of lymph tissue to kind of catch or kind of stop anything harmful from entering further down into the digestive tract. So lingual tonsil kind of at the base or the root of the tongue, the palatine tonsils on the sides, and the pharyngeal tonsil more in the back. So you can see the tonsils shown there. Your tonsils can become red and inflamed, and the doctor will look at that when he looks in your mouth as well. Lymph nodes then are rounded structures. They vary in size. They're located near lymphatic vessels, and you have lymph nodes in the groin, the armpit, and the neck region and lymph will pass through lymph nodes before entering the blood. Uh, lymph will move through uh, the immune system then, and the immune system will then be activated as lymph moves through it. Specifically, lymphocytes will be produced, and this is where we kind of have the connection between your lymphatic system and your immune system. Your lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell um, if anything foreign is detected, lymphocytes have a very complex process for removing microbes by macrophages. And we'll talk a lot about lymphocytes in this chapter. So here's a lymph node showing how tissue moves through the lymph node. Um, you know that you see the lymphatic nodules, the lymphatic sinuses are the areas of drainage where things travel through lymphatic tissue. You have afferent vessels carrying lymph into the lymph node. Those are afferent. And then efferent vessels moving lymph out of the lymph nodes with those one-way valves. There's a capsule to the lymph node, which is usually just a hardened piece of connective tissue. And then the trabecula will be spaces in between the lymph nodules as well. The spleen then is one of our lymph organs. It's the size of a clenched fist. It's located in your abdomen and it helps to filter blood and recycle and destroy old red blood cells. It can also detect and respond to foreign substances. So that's why I include it in your lymphatic system. And it kind of acts as a blood reservoir because it will be where some of your excess blood goes to um, before the blood gets recycled and broken down. The spleen is made up of white pulp and red pulp. Um, white pulp will be the lymphatic tissue that surrounds arteries. So it will be whiter in color because it doesn't have arteries in it. And then the red pulp contains the macrophages and red blood cells that will connect to veins. So here we have the splenic artery and veins bringing blood supply to and from your spleen. And then you can see the white pulp surrounding areas of red pulp. Um, again, the red pulp is where you'll have the arteries and white pulp is where you'll just have your lymphatic tissue. The thymus gland is located in the mediastinum right behind your sternum or your breastbone. So kind of the area right between your lungs where your aorta and pulmonary trunk will come out of the heart. You'll have your thymus gland right there. It's bilobed and it stops growing at the age of one. And then when you become 60, it actually starts to decrease in size. But what your thymus gland is good for is it produces and matures these lymphocytes. 
which are again, the special type of white blood cell that will go on to have a variety of different effects on keeping your body free and clear from anything foreign that could have and has a, have entered it. So here's your thymus gland, kind of this bilobed gland um, in the mediastinum region. So kind of where your aorta is, you'll see kind of tissue of the thymus gland shown here. There's an inner medulla and outer cortex region of lobules. You'll see lymph nodes kind of around it as well. So that's your thymus gland. And this is just kind of the main overview of your lymphatic system. And this is just a good slide to study if you're still kind of confused what your lymphatic system does. Again, I like to describe it, it's kind of your catch-all system that catches all excess fluid and brings it back to venous circulation. But there's other parts to it. The spleen filters blood. Your bone has red bone marrow that makes some B cells and pre-T cells, which are some of your lymphocytes. The pre-T cells go to your thymus gland to make T cells, which are important. Um, B and T cells go to throughout all lymphatic tissue, and then they circulate, and your B and T cells are what kind of are important um, kind of defense mechanisms of your body to fight off anything foreign or bacteria. And again, we'll spend a lot of time um, going into that kind of in the second half of this lecture as well. So immunity then. Immunity is your ability of your body to resist damage from anything foreign. And immunity can protect against microbes, against toxins, and against cancer cells. We have two different types of immune, immunity, innate or adaptive, and we'll go through those too. So innate immunity is what is present in all of us at birth. It's defense against any pathogen. It usually involves um, physical barriers, chemical mediators, cells, and the inflammatory response. So this is what we are born with, innate immunity. Physical barriers are the first line of defense in our body, such as our skin and all of our mucous membranes. You know, the mucous membrane that's covering your trachea, for example that tries to trap anything harmful that you might breathe in. Tears, saliva, and urine wash away all pathogens. So your tears, your saliva, these are all kind of our first line of defense as physical barriers. Chemical mediators are any chemicals as part of innate immunity that we're born with that can kill microbes and prevent entry into cells. So lysosome is a type of enzyme found in tears and saliva that helps to kill bacteria. And mucous membranes will also have some chemical mediators in them to prevent entry of microbes further into the body. Histamine promotes inflammation by causing vasodilation. So in an area of infection of bacteria, um, the histamine will promote kind of the vasodilation of your arteries so that more blood can go to that area of infection and the blood will bring with it these white blood cells, red blood cells to help um, get rid of anything foreign that might have caused that inflammation. Interferons are proteins that protect against viral infections. They will stimulate the surrounding cells to produce an antiviral protein. And then we have cells of your immune system. The white blood cells, we have five different types of white blood cells. They're produced in your red bone marrow and lymphatic tissue. So anywhere where you might have a lymph node, um, they will fight against foreign substances that might have entered the body. If we call a white blood cell phagocytic, that means it can eat up or phagocytize. That just means ingest and destroy um, anything foreign. So an example are the white blood cells, your neutrophils and macrophages are both phagocytic cells. So they're the ones that eat up or digest and destroy anything foreign. Uh, the neutrophils, remember, they're the most abundant white blood cells. So they'll be the first to respond to an infection, but they won't last very long. Acenophils are produced in red bone marrow and they will release chemicals um, to reduce inflammation. And then basophils are made in red bone marrow, and they will leave the blood, enter infected tissues, and they can be able to release that histamine, which help to dilate those blood vessels as well. So 
lots of different cells in your immune system to help fight off infection. Um, think of your body and these cells kind of like an army that's trying to protect you uh, from anything harmful that could have entered. Macrophages initially were a type of monocyte. Uh, they will leave the blood enter tissues. They're a lot larger, so they can just eat up more than a small neutrophil can. They will protect the lymph in the lymph nodes and blood in the spleen and liver. And the macrophages will give a specific name depending on where they are in the body. So a cuffter cell is in the liver, for example. You'll see other types of macrophages, um, you know, any cell that can phagocytize something, but they'll be called a specific name depending on where it is in the body. A mast cell, lots of cells here for you guys to study. Um, it is made in the red bone marrow. It's found in your skin, your lungs, your GI tract, the urogenital tract. It can release what we call leukotrienes, and we'll talk about what those are, leukotrienes or leukotrienes. Um, natural killer cells, these are a type of lymphocyte. And again, even the name of these cells give you kind of this like picture of a battlefield. These are your natural killer cells. Uh, they're a type of lymphocyte also made in your red bone marrow. They will recognize um, some classes of cells like tumor cells or virus infected cells. And what they do is they release a chemical to lice open those cells. So they are natural killer cells. They'll go to a tumor, a virus infected cell, release a chemical to make the cell lice or split apart. The inflammatory response then includes a lot of different chemicals and cells whenever there's injury to a certain part of the body. And it's signaled by the presence of a foreign substance, and it will stimulate the release of a chemical mediator to help, you know, bring as much kind of um, fighting power as we can to this area of injury. So let's go through kind of the steps of an inflammatory response and what that means. Um, bacteria enters a tissue, and that can be from getting a splinter, a cut, and not cleaning it, for example. It will damage the tissue, and that'll cause the release of chemical mediators. So chemotaxis, which is increased vascular permeability and blood flow will occur, which brings more white blood cells and chemical mediator, mediators to that area of tissue damage. The bacteria hopefully will be contained, destroyed, and phagocytized or eaten up. And either all the bacteria will be gone and the tissue will repair itself, or if bacteria remain, more chemical mediators will be activated to continue this process um, of kind of inflammation to get rid of that bacteria. Inflammation can present itself in a lot of different ways. It can present itself in a fever. So fever, um, swelling, redness to the skin, that all, those are all like um, signs that will present themselves that we see from the outside of the person. So if your, your kid has a fever or if you have a fever, your body is going through this inflammatory response to try to get rid of something foreign um, that's in the body. So we talked about innate immunity is present at birth, adaptive immunity, is defense that involves recognition to a specific antigen or protein um, that's usually foreign. So this immunity is required after birth and it will react when an innate defense doesn't work. So natural inflammation or these cells fighting, up, fighting off a bacteria. It's much slower than innate immunity, but it has memory, meaning that if these cells are exposed to a specific antigen, something foreign, for example, to the body, they will remember that antigen and then they'll be prepared if they see it again. This immunity uses B and T cells, which are types of lymphocytes, and there's two types of adaptive immunity. They can be antibody mediated or cell mediated talk about what those mean. So let's talk about a couple of terms before we get into this. This is the kind of the part of this lecture that's a little bit tricky because we're going to get into a lot of terms and um, things that are not really, you don't spend a whole lot of time in anatomy and physiology. Um, the word antigen is specifically a substance that stimulates an immune response. So antigens can be bacteria, viruses, pollen, food, or drugs. 
So an antigen is some sort of, I just would call it a protein in its simplest form, but it's something foreign to the body. Um, unless it's, we're talking about antigens on your red blood cells, which is a different, it, it kind of relates. But anything that stimulates an immune response is an, an antigen. A self-antigen is a molecule produced by the person's body that stimulates an immune response. And an antibody are proteins that the body produces in response to an antigen. And we know that because we know our plasma has antibodies um, against antigens that are not so to fight off any foreign antigens in our blood. Um, stem cells are formed in the red bone marrow and they will give rise to all blood cells, including red blood cells, including white blood cells, and including our lymphocyte cells which are pre-T cells and pre-B cells. So those are stem cells. Lymphocytes are a type of white blood cell. They are involved in adaptive immunity. So that means this idea of forming a memory from something foreign that would have entered the body and then adapting to that foreign substance to remember it. Lymphocytes are developed from stem cells and they will differentiate into types of lymphocytes such as B and T cells, and we'll go over those types of lymphocytes. B cells are a type of lymphocyte. They are involved in antibody immunity. They will originate from a stem cell, mature in your red bone marrow, and then moved to lymphatic tissue after they mature. And what you need to remember about B cells is that they produce antibodies. So our B cells are our lymphocytes that produce antibodies. The T cells are another type of lymphocyte. They are involved in what we call cell-mediated immunity first, as well as antibody-mediated immunity. They mature in your thymus gland, they move to lymphatic tissue after they mature. And you have four types of T cells. And this is where we're getting into a lot of detail here, a lot of different types of cells um, to try to fight off foreign substances. So again, think of this as your army of cells that's fighting off infection and bacteria. So here's just the origin and processing of these B and T cells. They all come from one kind of cell line called a stem cell in the red bone marrow. They'll differentiate into a pre B and T cells in the bone marrow. And then pre-B cells will, will form B cells, which will go to lymph nodes or lymphatic tissue. The T cells will mature in your thymus gland before they both, again, will go to lymphatic tissue. Antigen recognition. So lymphocytes have antigen receptors on their surface. They're called B cell receptors if they're on B cells and T cell receptors if they're on T cells. And each receptor only binds to a specific antigen. So when an antigen receptor combines with the antigen, which again is usually something I don't want to say, kind of foreign or bad to the body, the lymphocyte is activated and will start this adaptive immunity. So creating antibodies against that antigen and then remembering that type of antigen for future recognition. The major, so we're going to kind of talk through how this all occurs, how antibody-related immunity occurs, and then how cell-related immunity occurs. And again, this, this is going to be kind of detailed, kind of meaty, as I like to say, just a heads up, and I'll take us through it as simply as possible. The major histocompatibility complex molecule, I'll call it the MHC molecule for short, contains these binding sites for antigens, and they're very specific for certain antigens, and they will hold and present a processed antigen on the surface of the cell membrane. Then it will bind to the antigen receptor on either a B or a T cell to stimulate some sort of response. So that is the MHC molecule. A cytokine is a protein secreted by a cell that regulates neighboring cells. So for example, interleukin-1 is a cytokine released by a macrophage that will stimulate more helper T cells to come to the area. So this is a what we call proliferation or kind of making more helper T cells. We have an antigen 
um, being recognized and processed by a macrophage. And then it goes through this process where it, it kind of connects or is attached to this NHC molecule when, before it binds to a T cell receptor. And here's a helper T cell. We have interleukin receptors that again, interleukins will be a cytokine that helps to regulate more cells to come into play if we need more help. So what interleukins will do, it will kind of recognize and help this helper T cell to go on and further produce more helper T cells. And this is where we get a proliferation or the creation of more helper T cells, all in effort to fight off this foreign antigen that these cells are trying to recognize, try to process, and then try to remember for future use if they're in contact with it again. Lymphocyte proliferation. So after the antigen is processed with that MHC complex, it's presented to helper T cells. Helper T cells produce those interleukins. And these, again, these interleukins will just stimulate production of more helper T cells. And why we need so many helper T cells, we need to stimulate production of helper T cells because they are needed to produce the B cells. And again, going back to what I first told you, if you remember, B cells produce the antibodies. And the antibodies are important because once your body creates an antibody for an antigen, then it will always be able to recognize that antigen if it invades your body cells on future occurrences. So here's the proliferation of B cells, again, just showing um, how an unprocessed antigen combined to a B cell receptor on a B cell, forming an MHC kind of molecular complex, encouraging proliferation of more helper T cells, which will in turn encourage proliferation of all of these daughter B cells. And again, the daughter B cells will go and eventually form all these antibodies. And this is what we want. We want to create antibodies because these antibodies are what will be able to recognize future antigens or future enemies of the body and then be able to fight them off. Dual nature of your immune system. So lymphocytes will give rise to these two types of immune responses, antibody mediated or cell mediated. And antigens can trigger both types of responses. And again, 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 an antigen is anything foreign. Both types, antibody mediated or cell mediated are able to recognize the self versus the non-self and use specificity as well as have memory for future invasions. Antibody mediated will be effective against, against all antigens in your body fluids like blood and lymph. Um, so this will be effective, effective against bacteria, viruses, and toxins. And again, antibody mediated immunity will use B cells to produce antibodies. An antibody structure is literally looks like a Y and the variable region, this V part, that will be what it binds to the epitope of the antigen using the antigen binding site. And then the stem of the Y, which is down here, that is kind of named as the constant region. Um, and each class of immunoglobulin, which is a type of antibody has the same structure. So for example, here's the antibody structure. We have the V region, and these will be made up of light and heavy train chains that bind to the antibody here. And then the constant region is made up of light and heavy chains, and they will be binding to macrophages, basophils, and other white blood cells. So that is kind of the stem region of the antibody structure. The antigen binding site is the site on the antibody where the antigen binds, that is shown here. Um, valence describes the number of antigen binding sites on an antibody. And there's five different classes of what we call immunoglobulins used to destroy antigens. And these five classes are shown here, IgG, IgM, IgA, IgE, and IgD. And they all have kind of different antibody structures slightly and they'll bind to different antigens. But you can see kind of they're made up of heavy and light chains um, and how they're kind of 
form these different immunoglobulins, which are just different types of antibodies. IgG is the most common. So that's this little guy right here. So IgG is the most common. It activates complement and increases phagocytosis. It can cross the placenta and provide protection to the fetus. And this is what will be responsible for the RH reactions, like hemolytic disease of the newborn. So this is the antibody that if the mom has an antibody against the RH factor, that positive factor, this antibody, the IgG, this is what can cross the placenta and attack that RH antigen in newborns and just cause destruction of the cells um, and could be fatal to the newborn. IgM is a little less common. It activates complement and acts as an antigen binding receptor on the surface of B cells. And this is what's responsible for transfusion reactions. So the antibody that's responsible for transfusion reactions in your ABO system. And it's usually the first antibody uh, produced in response to an antigen. IgA is about 50% of the serum. In your plasma, it's secreted into your saliva, tears, and mucous membranes. It helps to protect body surfaces. And this is a big one found in colostrum and milk. Um, if a woman is breastfeeding to provide immune protection to the newborn, uh, that's IgA. IgE is the least common, the rarest. It binds to mast cells and basophils. It stimulates the inflammatory response. And IgD is also pretty common. It functions as an antigen binding receptor on B cells. So those are the types of antibodies. And the effects of antibodies, all of these antibodies will try to inactivate an antigen. So whatever foreign has invaded your body, your antibodies want to inactivate. It will bind antigens together and activate what we call complement cascade reactions. It will initiate the release of inflammatory chemicals to try to come to that area of damage and then facilitate phagocytosis, which is the eating up of that antigen. So here's a look at the different effects of antibodies in activating the antigen. It will bind antigens together. It will activate a complement cascade, which helps to initiate kind of inflammation, lysis of the antigens. And then it will also initiate the release of inflammatory chemicals, which again tries to do everything possible to get rid of that antigen from the body. Antibody production, so how are antibodies produced? Well, we'll talk about B cells. Um, the primary response, so first exposure of a B cell to an antigen causes the B cell to undergo division to form plasma cells and memory cells. The plasma cells from the B cells are what will produce the antibodies, and it usually takes about three to 14 days um, to be effective against the antigen. And the person will develop disease symptoms before it can produce these antibodies. The secondary response of B cells include the production of memory cells to the antigen. And this occurs when your immune system is exposed to that foreign antigen um, that has been seen before. The B memory cells will quickly divide to form plasma cells, which produce those antibodies, and that produces new memory cells. So now we're getting this type of adaptive immunity and that these memory cells will remember what the, whatever foreign was that was introduced into the body. So here we have the B cells producing what we call plasma cells and memory cells. The memory cells will go on to produce more memory cells and more plasma cells. The first response produces few antibodies from the plasma cells. But then on like a second exposure, this is called the secondary response, more antibodies will be produced because the plasma cells now um, will know after a second exposure what the antigen is. Cell-mediated immunity. So up until this point, we've talked about antibodies. A lot of information there. Cell-mediated immunity is used against antigens in cells and tissues. And it will be effective against um, bacteria that invades your cells, viruses, fungi, and protozoa, which all sound wonderful. Um, it uses different types of T cells for cell-mediated immunity. 
And this is where we get into some more of our soldiers in our army of defense mechanisms that we have. We have helper T cells that activate macrophages to form B cells to produce antibodies. They also promote the production of cytotoxic T cells. And cytotoxic T cells will be a precursor to what we call cytotoxic T lymphocytes or CTL. Cytotoxic T cells will destroy the antigen on contact. Again, I keep thinking of like soldiers and war, and but think about your body is just kind of this fighting mechanism that has all of these different weapons and soldiers ready to fight anything foreign that enters it. So your cytotoxic T cells destroy antigens on contact. Regulatory T cells will then turn off all of the immune system response when the antigen is gone, so your body won't need it anymore. So here we have proliferation of cytotoxic T cells. Again, we have this NHC molecule that just helps to process and recognize the antigen on the target cell. We have the cytotoxic T cell, which again, if you remember, kind of the encouragement is from these interleukins to create more daughter T cells. And these T cells will either produce the cytotoxic T cells, which will release cytokines to produce inflammation and activate secondary responses or kill cells on contact. And when you say kill cells, usually that means that the cell will lyse or break apart and open so it's destroyed, or the T cell will create more memory T cells. So immune interactions, kind of putting everything together here, you know, we have some sort of antigen that enters the body. And if it has, if it's, you know, we talk about innate immunity is the, are the physical barriers that we're born with natural white blood cells were born with chemical mediators. Um, and then the adaptive immunity is then a specific response that will improve with subsequent exposure to that antigen. So think of adaptive immunity as like memory recognition of that foreign structure. So then this is where we spent a lot of time talking about adaptive immunity. We get you know, a recognition of an antigen, a helper T cell producing more helper T cells, which will go on to produce B cells or cytotoxic T cells. The B cells, again, those are antibody related immunity, where it's the production of antibodies. And the helper T cells, cell mediated immunity, which will kill cells on impact or create memory cells. And in both cases, we're creating memory cells of memory B cells and memory T cells. And those are both responsible for remembering a future antigen after a secondary exposure. Then we'll get to adaptive immunity, whether it's, um, and we'll talk about naturally acquired adaptive immunity. Um, naturally acquired immunity, this happens naturally. It usually an active natural acquired immunity is when you're naturally exposed to an antigen that causes the production of antibodies. So for example, this can be lifelong. An example is if you get mononucleosis, um, if you got the chickenpox, if you're old like me, there wasn't the chickenpox vaccine yet, so I got it in kindergarten. So that's an example of active natural immunity. You're exposed to an antigen, and then you're usually um, kind of protected against it for, it can be lifelong, it might not be. In the example of COVID, you know, with the different strains that started to come out, you know, at first they thought once you get COVID, you'll be fine and you won't get it again, but then there were different strains that came out. Passive naturally acquired immunity is the transfer of antibodies from mother to ch child that occurs via the placenta that antibodies can pass over or in breast milk. So that's a passive transfer of antibodies or an active transfer of antibodies would be if you're exposed to mononucleosis, um, uh, chicken pox, for example. Then we get to artificially acquired immunity. And this is where, you know, the medical scene has just made tremendous strides in terms of, you know, thinking back to polio, rubella, mumps, which were just blowing out of control in the 20s and 30s. Um, you know, this idea of injection of antigens using vaccine 
um, vaccines was incredibly helpful. So they, this is artificially acquired immunity. An active form is injecting the antigen using a vaccine, which causes the production of an antibody. So what you're doing is you're pretty much, you're injecting the foreign substance into someone so that they can be exposed to it. So that that, that, that person can acquire this kind of memory and immunity against it. Immunization is a process of introducing a killed, live, or inactivated pathogen. So you're not giving someone um, necessarily an activated path pathogen, but you're giving them a way to be exposed to the antigen and then having that person's cells use their own cells to produce an immunity. Um, a passive form is injecting antibodies from another person or an animal, so someone else that has already formed the antibodies and injecting those antibodies into you. So these are different ways, and I'll end with this slide for this lecture, um, the ways to acquire adaptive immunity. And again, adaptive immunity is memory of something foreign. So Again, adaptive immunity is so important because if your body can remember what it's seen before, it'll be able to fight off the infection or bacteria that much faster. Active immunity is immunity provided by the individual's own immune system, either naturally exposed to mono or chickenpox or artificially exposed um, where it's deliberately introduced in a, in a vaccine. Passive immunity is then transferred from another person or an animal. Natural it is usually from the mom through her breast milk, through her placenta, or artificial passive immunity is introducing antibodies from another person or an individual. So with that, I will stop the recording.